coming and worshiping with us. Uh, excited today, uh, we are in uh, part three uh, of this series that we started called Mic Drop. Uh, we're looking at some of the shocking statements of Jesus. And if you've ever read through the Gospels before, um, you probably come across some shocking things that Jesus said. And when you read those, we have one or two options. Uh, first, we can skip over it and say, well, you know, I don't really know what Jesus meant by that, and we can just kind of skip over it and just move on to the next verse. Uh, or another is sometimes what people do is sometimes people uh, take it out of context, and they look at that verse, and, and maybe, they, uh, maybe they don't understand it and misuse it in some sort of way. And so that's another thing sometimes people do. But what we're doing is actually a third option, is we're actually digging into them and, and asking, okay, what did Jesus mean by some of these shocking statements, like, like the statement we talked about week one, about when Jesus said to hate your mother and father and your brothers and sisters and, and you know, your, your children. I mean, that's a shocking statement, right? And so we dug into that, and as we looked at it, you know, we studied, you know, what Jesus really meant there, he was really talking about priorities. The word hate in the Bible is, isn't how we use the word hate. It actually means, uh, it actually means to love less. And so Jesus was talking about, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, it means we put him first. We pick up our cross, right? And then last week, we talked about a really fun one. I was wondering who was going to return, come back, <laughs> come back next Sunday after the hard one we preached last week about, you know, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off, right? If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. That's a really hard statement that Jesus made. Um, but again, as we dug into that, Jesus, is, Jesus wasn't talking about physically. He was, Jesus often uses hyperbole. And so, but, but Jesus was making the statement, though, that if, if there's something in our life that causes us to stumble or trip us up, sometimes we have to go to the extreme to cut that thing off of our lives. If it's hurting us, as if it's hurting other people, if it's hurting our relationship with God, then cut it off. Get, get rid of it. Get rid of it. So today, uh, we're going to continue this. And by the way, next week, we're going to wrap this up. I'm probably going to be talking about one of the most shocking statements that Jesus ever made about forgiveness. So I, I, I will encourage you to be here next week. Uh, but this morning, we're going to look at another shocking statement of Jesus. And, th and this whole series has been called Mic Drop. And kind of the idea of Mic Drop, of course, is this. is you Usually, if somebody's you know, in a performance, it's the last thing that they say. And to kind of emphasize the last thing that they say, they drop the mic down and walk away. Like, show's over, folks, right? And they walk away. But in this statement that we're going to be looking at today, this is interesting. Jesus made a sh very shocking statement. But instead of Jesus walking away, the crowd walked away. The crowd walked away because what Jesus said offended them. And so I don't know if you've ever been like in that situation. Maybe you've been in a movie or, or maybe in a performance or something and somebody said something that was maybe offensive. Maybe you had little kids and in the room and they probably shouldn't be hearing some of the things that whatever, whatever's on the screen or whatever somebody's saying. And, and so you decide this is offensive and you decide to get up in the middle and you just decide to walk out. And this is kind of what's happening here in this, in this scripture that we're going to look at, that the people were offended by what Jesus had to say, and they actually walked away. And so let's take a look at it, the offensive statement that Jesus made. John chapter 6, 56. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. I want to just pray over this message this morning. Father, I thank you for today. And I just pray this morning that you would open our hearts to receive, God, what you have for us. And that, Lord, that as we study this text, God, that we would understand the cost that was paid, Lord, as you sacrificed your flesh and your blood for our salvation. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 656 almost seems like it's something that's been taken out of uh, pop culture or a, a, a sci-fi or horror movie, right? Uh, because Jesus is talking about drinking blood, and he's talking about eating flesh, right? It almost seems like Jesus is talking about vampires and zombies, doesn't it? If you've read this before, I mean, uh, you know, for, let's just take, for example, vampires. I, I didn't realize this. Vampires uh, actually began all the way back in the 18th century. Th this is interesting to me. Uh, in Western Europe, that some of the people actually believed that their vampires were real, 
And, and it, uh, it was such a big deal that those who they believed were vampires, they burned them at the stake. And so this actually happened in the 18th century. So this term was popularized then. And then, of course, when modern fiction was born, many writers used kind of that imagination and they began to write about vampires. And probably the most popular vampire ever is, of course, Dracula, right? And in 1897, uh, the novel Dracula was written and that became a legend. And so we have films, we have video games, uh, we have, of course, TV shows, all these sorts of things about vampires. And, of course, the famous saying of Dracula is what? I want to suck your blood. Right? Did I say that right? So that's, you know, because, of course, that's what vampires, right? They want to suck your blood. So yeah, that's how they get their life. So vampires and then zombies, of course, zombies, they also got their start in the 18th century as well, uh, all the way back to Haitian folklore, where, of course, you have this idea of this dead body who's uh, resurrected. They carry a virus, and the way they spread the virus is by eating the flesh. Yes, I know. You're in church this morning. But eating the flesh of other human beings, they infect other human beings, and they become zombies. And, and of course, I, I'm an 80s child, and so for me, well, one of my favorite music videos of all time is none other than Thriller. So, I'm not going to sing it for you, but I can do a pretty good Michael Jackson. So, um, I love I love, love Michael Jackson. It was so bad when I was in school. I had, yes, I had the sequence white glove, and I used to ride around on my Huffy bike thinking I was cool with my sunglasses and my white glove, nodding, you know. So, anyways, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. I love Michael Jackson. Thriller was one of my favorite music videos of all time. Zombies, of course, have been popularized. Even our school did a whole... Uh, drama on zombies here this past year. So, you know, Walking Dead, and who doesn't like a good zombie burger, right? So, good, good, good place to eat. But so, so these things have been popular, popularized in our culture today, vampires and zombies. And so, when you read Jesus' words, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me. It almost sounds like Jesus is talking about vampires and zombies, or at least he's talking about some sort of cannibalism. Like, Jesus, what are you, are you out of your mind? And maybe that's why this verse was so shocking. So what we're going to do this morning, and we've been doing this over the last few weeks, is it's important that when we look at verses like this, we understand the context and we dig into it. And we look into, okay, so what was Jesus saying before? What was Jesus saying after? What was the setting and so, and under, understand this verse, you have to go all the way back to John chapter 6, verse 1. So we're going we're gonna to do a lot of scripture this morning. Uh, we're going to read more scripture than we, what we normally do on a Sunday morning. But I think it's important that we understand the context. So in John chapter 6 is the story of the feeding of the 5,000. If you grew up in church, you're, you might be familiar with this story. This is where the, the masses were following Jesus. It's getting late. The sun's going down. The disciples are like, Jesus, we need to send these people home because it's getting late, uh, because they're getting hungry. And Jesus is like, well, what do we have? And they're like, well, there's thousands of people here, Jesus. We, we can't feed these people. And so he, he tells them to go, go find what they have amongst the crowd. So, so they come back and they find a little boy that has a sack lunch. As you probably remember the story in Sunday school, you know, he had five loaves of bread and two fish. And Jesus blesses that and it multiplies and he's able to feed the masses. Now, when the scripture says 5,000 people, it actually just says 5,000 men. That doesn't include the women and the children. Some scholars believe that Jesus could have fed up to 30,000 people that day. So imagine that, feeding 5,000 men, and that does include the women and the children, possibly 30,000 people. And so now all of a sudden, the people are amazed by what Jesus has done for them. And Jesus needs a moment alone. He wants to get alone and pray. He gets on a boat. He goes across the lake. But the masses want to find him because they want something from him. So they go searching for him. They hop on their own boats. Uh, you know, they, they go across the lake, and they're looking everywhere for Jesus. And they finally find Jesus in John chapter 6, verse 26 through 27. And Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, 
but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, for on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. So the crowds, these masses of people, they find Jesus after he performs this feeding, and, and he says, instead of looking for me, you're looking for me to, because your stomachs were full. You're looking for me because I performed a miracle. Now, understand the context here. Now, today in our world, we can go to the grocery store and we can, we can buy what we want. But understand that there's a lot of things going on in this miracle, the feeding of the 5,000. Not only did Jesus perform this miracle by multiplying the food, but I think there's a, even a, a greater picture here of what's happening because in this time period, right, to feed that amount of people in one setting, there's only one type of person that could do something like that. And that would be a king or a ruler. Because you imagine feeding, having that amount of food at one time to feed the masses. That was unheard of during that time period. The only type of person that could do that would be a king, Right? Someone who had the food supply. Someone who was in charge of the food chain. You know what I'm saying? And so for them, yes, there's the miracle side of the multiplication, which of course is, is, is big. But the other part of that is that they were following him because he just fed them. He just gave them food. So they saw him as a king, uh, one with power, one with authority. And so Jesus is saying, you've come all the way over here because your stomach is full, because I've performed this miracle, but I'm here to tell you, I can give you something more. I can give you eternal life. I can give you eternal life. And we don't have time to get into this, but it's interesting because it just, it just goes over their heads because they're still thinking about food. And so then they go into the story of how God provided food for the Israelites when they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, if you know that story. Because in the wilderness for 40 years, God provided manna from heaven. Every single day, God provided food for them from heaven, and he gave them just enough for that day. And so they're thinking, okay, Jesus, is, he's got some sort of connection with God. He's, he's a king. He's a person of authority. So he's thinking maybe Jesus is going to do something like the Old Testament where he's going to provide us food every day from heaven or he's going to multiply food for us every day. He said, this is what Moses did for us. What are you going to do for us? Again, they're still wanting something from Jesus. And then Jesus makes this first shocking statement. We didn't read this one. But this is another shocking statement that Jesus made in John 6, 35, where he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. How many of you remember the old Snickers commercial? Only Snickers will what? Satisfy. Remember the, the funny one where it's like you're, you're not yourself when you're hungry, you know, and, and it would always, they'd, they'd always turn into somebody else, you know, because you're hangry. You're hangry. Anybody ever been hangry before? You get a little irritable. And, and so when you're, when you're hungry, you're not yourself. And so, of course, food only lasts for so long. You, get, you can only go without food for so long. So you get fed, but then you get hungry again. And so what Jesus is saying here is, listen, even with Moses and the manna from heaven, the Israelites still got hungry. They still needed more manna. They still needed more physical food. But Jesus is saying, I'm going to give you something better. Jesus is saying, I am that something better. I am the bread of life. And if you come to me, you'll never be hungry and you'll never be thirsty. But Jesus wasn't talking about physical food here. He was talking about spiritual. And here's kind of my first big idea this morning is this, is the bread of life brings satisfaction to the soul, not the stomach. The bread of life brings satisfaction to the soul, not the stomach. That's what Jesus is talking about here. They were looking for physical food, but Jesus is saying, I have spiritual food. I have something even better. And Jesus is saying that, he, that the bread is his flesh. He is, he is the bread in flesh and blood. Jesus was God. He's fully man. He is the God-man in flesh and blood. He is the bread of life. Jesus is talking about something much more greater than food. Now, here's the thing, folks. When we read the Gospels, we have the benefit of knowing the end of the story, Right? Because we know. 
If, if, you, if you've ever read the Bible, at least most people know the story that Jesus died on the cross, right? So when we read something like this, we know what's going to happen. We know that Jesus eventually is going to go to the cross. But understand, the crowds, the masses, they, they didn't have the benefit that we have today. They didn't know. They were just wanting their stomachs to be full. They were just wanting a king. They were just wanting a ruler. We know the end of the story. They didn't. And so this was very, very confusing to them. But Jesus is talking about here that he is the bread of life. He is God in the flesh, flesh and blood right here. If Through a relationship with me, you can have satisfaction not for the stomach but for the soul. And we know the story. Before Jesus went to the cross, he was lashed. 39 times. Literally with a leather whip, that the end of the leather whip was tied pieces of glass and pieces of rock that literally tore his flesh. Tore his flesh. So it, as his flesh was torn, then they put a crown of thorn on, on his head. Again, his flesh of his head was torn. And then they took the nails and pierced his hands and his feet. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie The Passion. Uh, it probably depicts the crucifixion, probably one of the best that I've ever seen. If you've, it, it can kind of churn your stomach. But in the Passion, it shows how, how Jesus was tortured and how every, every piece, every amount of his body was literally covered in blood. There wasn't, it, his whole body was covered in blood. And so Jesus' flesh was torn. His blood was spilled. Jesus is talking about this, that he is the bread of life, the flesh and blood. And then in John 6, 50 through 51, he goes on to say, but here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Jesus is saying, you're here and looking for the next miracle, but I have something better to give, and it's myself. It's my flesh, and it's my blood. Now listen to the response of the crowd in 652. And when the Jews began to argue sharply amongst themselves, how can this man give us flesh to eat? So they're, they're very, very confused. How, what are you talking about, flesh and blood? What are you talking about eating bread? Uh, we just want a miracle, Jesus. We just want a next meal, Jesus. Now you're talking about eating flesh and drinking blood. This is just, this is hard. And then Jesus makes the shocking statement that we read earlier, but I want to read it all in its context. Because in 50, 53, this is what Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up in the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them, just as the living Father has sent me, I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna, but they died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Now understand if you're a first century Jew, and you're living in this, First of all, Jesus' words seem very blasphemous. Because according to the law, Jews could not drink blood. <laughs> in fact, even in the sacrificial system, they drained the blood. And so you, you think of all this, Jesus is talking about flesh and blood. And you talk about flesh, again, a, a, the priests, the Levites, they, they avoided a dead corpse. Because dead corpse was considered unclean if you touch something that was dead. So now Jesus is talking about blood. He's talking about flesh. And to them, this is blasphemous. This is hard. What are you talking about? And so listen to the crowd's response in verse 60 through 61. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is hard teaching. Who can accept it? And aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said, does this offend you? <laughs> does this offend you? Obviously it did, because in 66, it says, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Mic drop. And instead, the crowd walked away. It offended them. 
Jesus offended the crowd and they walked away. As a preacher, I'll be honest, this, this encourages me a little bit. Because every once in a while, sometimes people get offended by something that a preacher says and people walk away and they, they leave the church. And, I, and, and so I, I look at something like this and I say, man, well, if Jesus had people leave his church, maybe I shouldn't get so worked up when somebody leaves mine. But it's true. Jesus said some offensive words here, but he's speaking the truth. But this is a pivotal moment in Jesus' ministry, friends. We kind of covered this in week one because to them, these were harsh words. They were hard to understand. They just wanted a full stomach. <laughs> they just wanted another meal. They wanted a ruler. They wanted a king on this earth. But Jesus came to bring something entirely different. Jesus came as the bread of life, not to bring satisfaction to the stomach, but to satisfaction to the spirit, to the soul. He came to bring eternal life. That's what Jesus is talking about. Now understand in verse 67, listen to this. Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, you do not want to leave too, do you? <laughs> Jesus asked the 12. So now it's just Jesus and the 12 disciples. Just them. Everybody else is gone. And Jesus looks at them and says, do you want to leave? Do you want to leave too? This is, a, this is really a, a, a pivotal moment again. I've said that a few times. But again, the crowds act as, they really acted as a buffer between the disciples and the Pharisees. Okay, I hope you're following here. The Pharisees from the very beginning, they wanted Jesus gone. They, they believed Jesus was a false prophet. They believed that he was a false teacher. They believed from the beginning a lot of the things that he said were blasphemous. He, because again, he challenged their thinking on the law. So they wanted Jesus gone. But they couldn't get to Jesus because Jesus had a following. He was performing miracles, and people were following him because of the miracles. So people believed that he possibly could have been the Messiah. So Jesus had this mass following, and the Pharisees couldn't get to Jesus because of that. So now the crowd is gone. There's no longer a buffer between the disciples and the Pharisees, which means their lives are going to be on the line. And Jesus looks at them and says, you don't want to leave too, do you? Do you want to go? But look at verse 68. And this is the key verse this morning. Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Can we just all say that together, Lord, to whom shall we go? Let's say that together. Lord, to whom shall we go? Can we say that again? Lord, to whom shall we go? One more time. Lord, to whom shall we go? This is really important. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, but again, this text kind of lines up with a few weeks ago. That Jesus is teaching that sometimes following him is going to be difficult. And so following Jesus doesn't always mean a full stomach. Sometimes it doesn't always mean that every prayer that you pray is going to be answered. Sometimes it means if you follow Jesus, you're not going to be very popular. Right? And so even though some of these things are great, and yes, God does answer prayer. Yes, God does prosper us at times. But there, sometimes there are seasons in our life that can be difficult. And it's in those seasons, I pray, that you ask this question that Peter said to Jesus, Lord, to whom shall I go? When things get difficult in my life, Lord, to whom shall I go? To whom shall I go? You know, we've, we've faced a season of difficulty as a nation, right? A season of a pandemic. We're right now in the midst of this war. Who knows what's going to happen there? Inflation, high gas prices, all these things. But I pray that we would be like Peter and ask this question, Lord, to whom shall I go? I, I want to give you this morning, if you're taking notes, three seasons of difficulty. And in these seasons of difficulty, I pray that you would ask that question that Peter asked, to whom shall I go? The first season is this, the season of transition Season of transition. We all go through transitions in life, and sometimes when we face transitions, it can be difficult. 
How many, let me just ask this question. How many youth group kids do we have? How many grew up in church and went to some sort of church youth group? Okay. All right. Pull, pull up your hands higher. I want to, I want to, okay, good. Thank you. Okay. So, oh man. So good portion of us. So I'm a youth group kid. I didn't give my life to Jesus until I was 13. So I didn't grow up in like when I was a child, but uh, my dad died when I was 13, as many of you know. So, uh, so I started attending church uh, in eighth grade. And so I loved youth group. I loved my youth pastor. We used to do monthly activities. We'd go to, uh, you know, arcades back when, our, when they had arcades. You know, um, you know, youth conventions, camps, all these sorts of things. Uh, I, I wanted all my friends to know Jesus. I, I, I wanted, invited them to youth group, and this was my evangelistic tool. I told all my friends that there were cute girls in the youth group, and they came. I remember, I remember we had this, this outreach that uh, my youth pastor wanted to get 100 kids in, on a Wednesday night to youth group. And uh, that's what I did. I just went and all my friends and said, hey, you want to come to youth group? There's some cute girls there. And I, I brought, I won the prize. I think I brought 12 friends and, and, uh, and whatever. I think I got a gift card somewhere. And, and so, uh, so, you know, so youth group was fun right? And, and there is, there's that season. But then there's a transition. And if some of you may remember this, uh, after, after high school, you go to college or maybe you go, uh, you know, you, get, you go into a career and then all of a sudden your faith is challenged, right? There's, there's no longer the Wednesday night youth group. There's no longer your mom or your dad telling you to go to church. And then you go to college and you find out there are people that don't believe the same as you do. And some people even challenge your faith. Some people poke holes in your faith, and so some people even say, well, Christianity, there's nothing to stand on, and they, they argue against the Old Testament, and they argue against certain things. Maybe even the New Testament say you can't believe the Bible. It can't be trusted, and then there's maybe even a professor in that college, and he has a PhD, and so he seems really smart, and so since he's I got a PhD, he's got to know something, and so he's arguing against the Bible, and so now all of a sudden you're in this season of transition, and you wonder, is this thing really true? Is this thing really true? It's not the fun and the games or the cute girls in youth group. It's, it's no longer that anymore. Now all of a sudden I'm faced with these questions. And all of a sudden you have to make a decision in this season of transition. What are you going to do? To whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? Uh, maybe, maybe, it's not, maybe it's not that, but maybe for some of us it's a season of transition in a job. Right? Maybe, uh, maybe it's you get into an industry where, uh, again, to be a Christian is hard because you have to tell the truth. And some of the people in your industry, they don't want you to tell the truth because they're not looking at truth, they're looking at profits, right? So they're looking at profits, and so when you tell the truth or when you're trying to do the right thing, they're telling you not to do the right thing because, because again, they're looking at the bottom line. And there's a, it's a decision that you have to make, a transition that you have to make. And so think of this. I had a conversation with a gentleman just a couple weeks, not even that long ago. And he was talking about how his business sent him on a trip overseas. And literally, they knew he was a Christian. They knew he was a Christian, but yet they wanted to get at him. And so he was alone in his hotel. And somebody knocks on his door. He opens his door, and there were three prostitutes that was standing outside of his door that his company had sent to him. True story. And he said, I had to make a decision at that moment. It, you know, again, my company had sent this to me, but I have my family at home. I have my kids at home. And he says, at this point, my faith, I had to make a decision about my faith and reject that, even though that's what my company wanted me to do. You see, season of transition. I think in the United States, we're in a season of transition, right? Uh, United States used to be a, a Christian nation. We are no longer a Christian nation, according to recent studies. We are a post-Christian nation. And so we've gone through this transition uh, as a nation where, where now today, I think only 7% of our nation actually believes in a biblical worldview 40% say they're Christian, but if you, if you really get down to the questions of the Bible, 7% have a biblical worldview. And I think we went through a transition in the pandemic. Because if you look at the pandemic, again, we've seen this transition when, uh, you know, when churches closed and, and everything. And, and, of course, online seemed great for a time being. I mean, that was really good for maybe two weeks 
And uh, for, for us, we've got five kids. And I don't know if you've got kids, but try to have your kids watch an online church service. It just doesn't work. They're getting up, getting drinks. They're going to the bathroom. And it's like, it's just not working for me, right? And so then when church finally came back, only 40% of people came back to church when churches were reopened. And of course, then there was kind of arguments within the church, and I'm, not, I'm talking about the church as a whole this morning. I'm not talking about just our, our church. I'm talking about church as a whole because I've talked to pastors. Because some people were mad that churches were opening too soon. Some people were mad because churches, uh, churches should have opened, uh, should be still closed. People were arguing over all sorts of things. And I know many churches that closed their door. I know pastors who retired or went into another industry because it was just too difficult. It was too difficult. And that's what I want you to see. In seasons of transition, it can be difficult, whether that's a a high school student going to college and all of a sudden your faith is challenged, whether that's in a job where you're transitioning in your job and your faith is challenged, it can be difficult, whether that's seasons as a nation and what we're seeing in our world, that can be difficult. But here's the question that we need to ask. When we face these types of seasons, to whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? Maybe it's not a season of transition, but here's the second thing, a season of trial, a season of trial. Because if we go back to the story of Jesus that faced the crowd, again, the crowds were looking for what Jesus could do for them. They were looking for the next meal. They were looking for a Messiah that was going to make life easier for them. And then Jesus starts talking about flesh and blood and eternal life. They were looking for the here and now. But he was talking about the hereafter. And so sometimes when we come to faith, let's just be honest, when we first come to faith, there is an excitement. It seems like every prayer we pray is answered. You know, we come to church, we feel the presence of God. You know, we're living our best life now, whatever, you know. And it just seems like everything's going right. But then you experience your first trial. And like I said earlier, maybe a prayer doesn't get answered. Maybe you lose a job. Maybe you struggle financially. Maybe you prayed for a loved one and it, 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 things got worse instead of better. And so you cry out to God and you say, God, where are you? This isn't what I signed up for. I thought you wanted to make my life easier. But the Bible never promises that. See, the Bible never promises a lack of trials. What the Bible does promise us is that he will be with us in the trials. And there's a big difference. And so, like the crowds, when we experience trials, I've seen this so many times, people experience hard, hardships and they walk away from their faith like the crowd. But I pray that like Peter, instead you would say, to whom shall I go? To whom shall I go? Here's the last one. Not only that, but season of doubt. Season of transition, season of tr- a trial, a season of doubt. So let's just get real this morning. We've all experienced doubts. Is God real? Is the Bible real? Is this just some fabricated story? Can Jesus be the only way to God with all these other religions in the world? And these are good questions. And I think if we do some studying and get down to it, we can have answers to these questions. And there are people that will try to poke holes in Christianity. And listen, I want to encourage you that when when you're questioned by these things, there are some great resources out there that you can go to. But there's, again... And seasons of doubt, it's not wrong to have doubts, but the key is, is where do we go to when we have doubts? Because there's nothing wrong with the doubt, but again, I want to challenge you, instead of focusing on the questions and instead of focusing on the doubt, put your focus on the person of Jesus. Because I think when you look at the person of Jesus, there is some very strong conclusions that we can make. Number one, Jesus was a historical person. Resources outside the Bible confirm this. Jesus fulfilled hundreds of prophecies. That's one of the uh, amazing. The mathematical chance of Jesus fulfilling all the prophecies in the Old Testament that were written thousands of years before he was even born is a mathematical zero, unless you're Jesus, unless you're God. Jesus' teachings are like none other in history. And lastly, there's a historical truth that Jesus died on the cross Not only is that a historical truth, but also the resurrection of Jesus, where there were over 300 witnesses that saw 
Jesus raised from the dead. And there's no other religion, there's no other God that you can go to their grave and, because their, their, their grave is still there. Their skeleton, their body remains are still there. You, you try to find the body of Jesus, you can't find him because he rose from the grave. He walked out of his tomb. He ascended into heaven. And so considering the options, again, if you have doubts, the, the questions and the doubts are okay, but I, I would say this, consider the options, <laughs> Consider Jesus, and like Peter, I hope that you should say, to whom shall I go? Do I go to other religions? Do I live a life of no purpose? Do I live my life for myself, and that's, I'm just going to be consumed with myself, and I just die, and that's the end of the story? Or do I believe that Jesus' words, that he promises eternal life? <laughs> to whom shall I go? So here's how I want to end this this morning. To whom shall I go? Because here's two questions. If not Jesus, who? And if not Jesus, what? If I'm not going to go to Jesus, then if not Jesus, who? And if not Jesus, what? Where do we go? If not Jesus, who? Who are you going to go to? If not Jesus, what? What are you going to go to? Where do the other paths lead you? I hope you would consider that this morning. Where do the other paths take you? Where do they lead your life? Where do you end up? Because Jesus said, he is the bread of life. Jesus said that he is the way and the truth and the life. And in Jesus, there is community, fellowship with God, community in the church. All of these things are in Jesus and I want you to understand this morning that Jesus never promised a problem-free life. But what he did promise is that he will be with us in this life. And so today, when life becomes hard and life becomes difficult, I pray that you ask this question, to whom shall I go? To whom shall I go? This morning, I'm going to ask uh, Jen or Olivia to come back to the keyboard. And so this morning, what I'd like us to do is take communion together. And though actually the worship team is going to come. I forgot we have the whole worship team. To whom shall I go? To whom shall I go? When there's a transition, do I remain faithful to God? To whom shall I go? Whether that's a transition into just life stages. Maybe that's a transition in a job. Or maybe as we see what's happening in our world today. To whom shall I go? When I face a trial. To whom shall I go? Whatever that trial may be. When I even face doubts and questions. Consider the options. To whom shall I go? Because if it's not Jesus, who? And if it's not Jesus, what? Because I believe this, that if we ask these questions this morning, we will have the same conclusion that the disciples had at the very end, where it's just the disciples and Jesus. And the disciples say, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And surely... You are the Holy One of God. Surely you are the Holy One of God. You see, that was the conclusion of the disciples, and they gave their lives for that. Jesus surrendered his life, and then later on, 11 of the 12 disciples were all martyred for their faith because they believed that Jesus was the Holy One of God. And to them, there was nowhere else to go. To him, there was nobody else to go to. He was the one who brought eternal life. He was the bread 